Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the 2022 iPhone Finance Summit. I am Wu Chen from iPhone.com. The theme of this summit is to row a boat in middle stream, which means to work hard in the middle of a crisis or during the most challenging times. Tonight's topic focuses on the global economic disasters brought by the U.S. Fed's unlimited QE policy. The Fed carried out unlimited QE to lessen the impact of the pandemic. However, this policy has led to a liquidity overflow, incurring enormous price pressure and inflation. The Fed has begun to tighten its monetary policy and raise the interest rate. Bringing great turmoil to the global capital market once again, there is little doubt that the unlimited QE policy has brought a series of huge disasters to the world economy. How should we interpret this policy, and what measures should we adopt to cope with these disasters? Next, we will connect with Mr. Richard Warner. The father and advocate of QE theory, and Mr. Gao Huasheng, professor of finance, deputy dean of the faculty and research at the Fanghai International School of Finance at Fudan University, Shanghai. Let's hear what they are going to say on these issues. Welcome. 各位来宾，各位观众朋友，大家晚上好。Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am Gao Huasheng. A professor of finance at the Fanghai International School of Finance at Fudan University. Today, I will chair tonight's discussion. Our guest is Professor Richard Warner. He was born in Germany and got a PhD in economics from Oxford University, UK. In the late 1980s, just before joining Oxford University, he applied to study at Fudan University as an exchange student. However, he couldn't make the trip, despite all documents being ready. But he joined us at Fudan University 30 years later. Instead of coming to Shanghai in the late 1980s, he went to study in Japan. He worked as a chief economist in a leading investment bank in Japan. Also, once worked for the Japanese government and was a professor at a Japanese university. Later, he moved back to Europe and has been teaching at European universities since then. Professor Warner is fluent in German, English, and Japanese. He learned Chinese during his three years at Fudan University. He is an expert in international finance with global perspectives. Professor Warner recently published a new book, "Where Does Money Come From?" A guide to the UK monetary and banking system. He is also an advocate of the QE theory. The topic of today's discussion is also about the disasters brought by the unlimited QE policy. Let's begin our talk. Okay, Professor Wenna, it's very、really, nice. It's very、really、nice to meet you. We know that over the last few months, the CPI in U.S. is rising dramatically. All my friends in the U.S. are complaining that the food price is going up, the gas price going up, and I check the data. Uh, over the last year, the CPI in U.S. rose up by seven percent relative to one year ago. That's a dramatic number. So my first question for you is:、uh, Is this great inflation of the U.S. caused by the policy mistakes by the Federal Reserve? Is it related to the last round of quantitative easing, please? Yes, thank you very much, and let me just say it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, and and it's a great honour to have you actually、um, as the moderator.、Um, I am particularly grateful for that.、Um, well, to answer your question,、um, in in short, yes, it is a result. This inflation is a result of the Federal Reserve's policy actions. Particular in particularly in the year 2020 from March onwards, and in fact at the time in that year,
I did monitor the central bank's policies and I was shocked by what they were doing because to me it was clear they were creating inflation. And so I actually, um, you know, went public in, in May um, 2020 and I, I warned and I said that in, in, in writing, I said that around 18 months later, we we're likely to get significant inflation. This is what we're experiencing now. So it is the entirely the result of Federal Reserve and, and in other countries, also European countries, central bank actions uh, as they expanded credit creation of the banking system for consumption. Of course, it was also furthered by government actions to give guarantees to banks to just lend willy nilly um, to, you know, these were various schemes to expand lending. And at the same time, checks were handed out for uh, furloughed workers. Um, but it was really the, the central bank's actions to expand bank credit creation that were the most important factor. Oh, okay, so uh, Richard, so do you think uh, so the cost of inflation is uh, they are intended to cause inflation or they are unintended to cause inflation? Um, well, with central banks, one always has the option that, oh, it's a mistake uh, as a possible explanation. Um, however, I've monitored them for many decades, um, particularly, you know, European and North American central banks. And often you really wonder, is this really just a mistake? Because it seems uh, very, co you know, very consistent mistakes that seem to align with, you know, with other uh, goals and agendas. So um, to me, it's also interesting if we compare this to the 1970s where we had also significant inflation. And it's interesting because the story in the media is quite similar. In the media, it's being said, oh, there's a war, uh, this time it's Russia, and there's an embargo, and, and you know, oil, gas exports are being reduced, uh, we have an oil shock, so there's inflation. That story is almost exactly the story of the 70s. Oh, there was a war in the Middle East, oil embargo, OPEC, oil price shock, therefore inflation. So to a lot of people, it seems, oh, this makes sense, you know, can't be helped, it's a shock. But when you examine the 70s, you realize that the inflation started before that war and before that OPEC embargo and before oil prices even rose. They only rose um, essentially from December 73, January 74. But inflation started earlier. We had significant inflation in Germany, in the US, in the UK already um, in early 73. Why is that? And if you then analyze bank credit creation um, one year before. So we're talking of, you know, 72 early and, and early 73. That's where we had massive, massive expansions in bank credit. And that clearly is also the reason in the 70s. So same in the 20s. And so how can this be a mistake? Because these are deliberate policies that you didn't have to take. Also, um, if we compare this QE of 2020 with the QE of 2008, there is a, a very important fundamental difference. And the 2008 QE was of a type that was non-inflationary. That can be done. We can talk about it if you want. And then 2020 QE was of that type that will create inflation. And the evidence is, I'm not saying this afterwards, I was actually at the time already in 2008, 2009, saying, no, this is not going to cause inflation. Now I'm in 2020, I, I want this is inflationary type of QE. So it makes it hard to believe that it's just a mistake. Oh, okay. So I, I know that you, the, the term quantitative easing is, is somehow is, is related to your earlier work. So uh, would you please explain in brief? So, wh what's the central idea of uh, qualitative easing? Does it really work? Thank you very much. Yes. Um, well, I coined this um, in Japan when I was there um, in the early 1990s. And you have to understand the situation. The situation was that, uh, first of all, in the 1980s, uh, Japanese banks were creating a lot of bank credit for uh, property real estate transactions. And when banks lend money, it's not just, um, you know, existing money. Actually, banks 
don't really lend money, they create money. So a loan is, is credit creation, money creation that adds to the money supply. So a lot of money was added to the money supply to purchase property. So property prices went up, land prices were crazy in the 80s. This game continues until they stop doing this and stop lending for property transactions. Then the land prices come down and usually, and so essentially it's an asset bubble, which will then collapse. And it will take the banking system with them if it's big enough. And it was very, very big in Japan. So I warned about this in 91 in my publications that there will be a big crash. The banks will go bust. And there will be a big recession like the Great Depression. And this was the beginnings was starting to happen 92, 93, but it was early stage. Most people thought there's no problem. It's just a slowdown. They do the usual interest rate reduction. Everything will be fine. But I was convinced oh, this is going to be really bad. And I was um, at the time chief economist of a British investment bank in Tokyo. So then I wrote an article published in the, the Nikkei, that's the Nihon Keizai Shimbun, the Japanese main financial daily newspaper. Stock index is also named after that. And I had a big article in there saying, well, there is a policy with which we can prevent this big problem and very quickly have a recovery. And what we need to do is clean up the bank balance sheets from the bad debts of the 80s. Um, the central bank can do this by purchasing non-performing assets from the banks, putting them on the central bank balance sheet, because you can do this through a subsidiary or directly. I mean, these are details. And essentially, if you buy them at close to, to a nominal value, the banking system very obviously will be completely strong again and very liquid and happy to lend. This QE proposal, that's one type of QE proposal I, I made. That's what uh, Ben Bernanke did in 2008 at the Federal Reserve. He understood this. He was part of the debates on Japan in the 90s. And that's why he even gave a speech at the LSE, which is my Alma Mater, where I did my first degree uh, in 2009, January, where he said, well, I don't want to call this what um, the Bank of Japan has called QE, because it's really more about credit. And the reason why he said is that, was, unfortunately, in Japan, they didn't take my advice. They then later used the name QE, and they said, oh, okay, well, let's do this. We're doing it. But really, they were just doing traditional monetarist, high-powered money expansion by... Um, essentially intervening and giving banks a lot of bank reserves, that doesn't help anything. So, but Ben Bernanke did the right policies in 2008. So as a result, the US banking system recovered quickest of any, despite the fact that that was the center of the crisis. However, what happened in 2020 was another type of QE, a different type. So Ben Bernanke was, was essentially doing what I advised that the goal was to get out of a, banking crisis and incipient banking crisis and have a recovery by helping the banks clean balance sheet and expand credit. But I also pointed out there's a faster way to do this. The second method, and that is for the central bank to purchase assets from the non-bank sector. Because when the central bank purchases assets from the non-bank sector, which is a bit unusual, but you know, QE was a kind of a sort of unusual, unorthodox monetary policy proposal. Um, when the central bank does that, the the asset sellers, let's say, I mean, it can be anything, can be pension funds owning bonds, um, as a simple example, but can be anything really. The seller um, has an account at a bank, and that account at the bank is now credited with the money from the central bank buying the assets, and um, Therefore, the bank now creates a new deposit on the liability side of the bank, which adds to the money supply. And there's new purchasing power now in the economy. That policy, the Bank of Japan for years, for 20 years, been saying, oh, we can't do that. That's impossible. What is he talking about? Well, funny enough, in March 2020, the Bank of Japan suddenly did it. It suddenly did. It suddenly knew exactly how to do it. And the ECB did it, and the Bank of England did it, and the Federal Reserve did it. Um, and that is, but it did it at the time when there was no um, decline in bank credit. My advice to Japan in, 19, in the 1990s was when bank credit was collapsing, was going to zero and also contraction negative credit growth. And then you need to stimulate it. My proposal, the two types of QE, 
Um, there's also some other policies, but these are the key ones. The proposals to expand bank credit again, then you get a recovery. But they adopted this in March 2020 at a time when bank credit was very strong in most countries already and made it even stronger. It was a, an excessive monetary expansion. And at the same time, they imposed restrictions on businesses to close down movement of people and so on. So the supply side was restricted. Now, what happens if you restrict the supply side and you increase the demand side extraordinarily, the biggest perhaps in the post-war era, you must get inflation. And that's what we got. Okay, I see. So, uh, so uh, Richard, so how do you evaluate the contribution of a qualitative easing into the economy overall? I know that's a different country, uh, adopt a different type of policy at a different type of time. <laughs> so overall, yes. how do you evaluate its contribution? Yes. Well, I would say one, I mean, there's, there's two aspects of the contribution. One is that um, it's, it's really in the name already, quantitative easing. One contribution is to make people aware that when we talk about monetary policy, it is not always just about the price. Because in English language, modern economics for the last 200 years since David Ricardo's classical economics onwards, Alfred Marshall Keynes, monetarism, Friedman, uh, new classical, contemporary monetary, because the whole history, they've always emphasized prices, including the price of money. And that's a, a phenomenon when you use an equilibrium framework, then prices are key in equilibrium. But what quantitative easing has shown is that we should not neglect the quantity side of things, not just the price of things, but also the quantity. And that's particularly important when markets are not in equilibrium, then you'd expect quantities to be more important. And as the name suggests, quantitative easing is essentially a statement saying, well, quantities can be extremely powerful and perhaps they're even more important than the price, like interest rates. So that's one contribution. It's a sort of fundamental contribution. The other contribution, um, more on the policy side, is I think it's it's been demonstrated to have a significant impact. Um, but of course, like any powerful tool, you have to be careful in how you use it. You know, any any tool where you work in a workshop or in a in the, in the garden even can also be dangerous if you use it wrongly, and and maybe you hurt somebody. So any tool is also responsibility. And we have to use it wisely. And I'm afraid central banks have not always used it wisely. So it, it, I, I would say there is a, a significant contribution, uh, both in terms of theory and also in terms of practical application. And on the practical application, I would just caution that we have to use it wisely um, and appropriately. And it was a tool developed for weak economic growth and a collapsing banking system to help in that emergency situation. And therefore, we should use it in those times, not when we actually um, restrict supply and we already have strong demand and it's going to cause inflation. Okay, Richard, you mentioned wisely, wisely, several times. So, do, do you, in your opinion, so what prevented a, a central bank from using these tools wisely? So, so the, the, I think they also want to be using the wisely. But what prevented them from from being wisely? Yeah, so thank you. That's a very good good question. Good point. Um, well, uh, there's there's two angles. One is just assuming that they have the same goals that we would also have. And I think as you're a you know a, a leading economist and uh, financial sector expert. And I think we would all agree that it is good to have financial stability and to have stable, sustainable economic growth. And so most people work with this as a premise and they assume that, of course, um, you know, that's the goal. So what do we do to achieve this goal? And um, if, if we assume that is really has been the goal, then they haven't used it wisely in 2020. But why not? And it seems they were either misinformed or there seemed to have been some kind of coordination at play. As I said, what they did in 2020, these purchase of assets from non-banks, is very specific. It's very unusual and also very rare to implement that policy if you go into central bank history. 
So, but they all did the same thing at the same time, so that it's it's quite obvious it's, it was coordinated. So that's an interesting empirical question to research into: who was leading that coordination? What was their thinking? And what were the goals? And I don't have the details yet, but we should look into this. Perhaps as a research project, we're very interested. Now, the other answer to your question is that it may also be that their goals were different from what we would sensibly, you know, like to have as a goal, namely financial stability, economic growth, sustainable growth. And I've encountered this before, and initially it's a bit surprising, but it can be that sometimes policymakers take the view that sometimes a shock to the system is good, and sometimes oh, we need a crisis in order to make changes. Um, now, I, I'm, a, I'm a critic of that. If that is the case, then that's not, not good. But that could t- potentially could also be a reason why they were not wise. Great, yeah. Thank you, Richard. So, so the, uh, in your opinion, for the year 2023, where the Federal Reserve successfully controlled the inflation rates around 2%? Um, well, there has been a quantitative tightening if we look at the same measures that I mentioned, then um, that was tightened in the year 2021, last year. More recently, it's it's expanded again. So because we have this lag effect, this you know 18 months um, or lead time of credit over the economy, um, to me it does look like inflation has peaked, more or less, and is likely to come down. Um, but what happens after that is still an open question. To me, it looks like, well, it will then come back. Um, but that's work in progress. We have to continue to monitor what they're doing in terms of the quantity of credit creation. Whether they'll achieve 2%, I doubt it. But it could drop back to, I could, I could imagine, something like 3 4%, and perhaps even 2%. But then maybe as an average, you maybe not likely to get 2% for the whole year, but we could we could briefly, uh, you know, by the end of the year, drop back to 2%. Um, unfortunately, maybe after that, it will accelerate again, which makes it, again, quite similar to the 70s, where we had a first bout of inflation, then that tapered off, but then there was, a few years later, another bout of inflation. Let's see whether that's the scenario, but we mustn't forget that the central banks are very much in charge of this, and we should keep, you know, monitoring them and put pressure on them to, to take the wise policies, um, because sadly they do this um, in, in Europe and America not so often. I'm, I'm a great admirer of the Chinese central bank. Um, as, as you know, I, I believe the central bank has done a fantastic job. We had 40 years of double digit economic growth, unprecedented in world history. Um, and sadly, somehow in Europe and America, central banks um, often seem to be other playing other games. Oh, uh, Richard, thank you for thinking highly of Chinese central bank. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, let's so we know that we our, our focus of today's conversation is about the quantitative easing, and we know this is. It's of course important for for inflation, and another important factor for inflation is indeed the war. We know war is 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 rare, but in Europe, in particular, there is a war that push up the oil price, which is somehow related to the high inflation. So in this year, particularly in this year, do you think if you put a weight on the quantitative easing on the monetary policy versus the real war? So do you think it's, what's the relative weight of these two factors in contributing in today's inflation, in your opinion? Um, it's clearly not the war. It is not the war. Um, certainly, or let, let me be more precise, it's not the war's effect on energy prices that is a causal factor. The war may be influential in another way, in terms of money creation, we see that many countries are giving billions and billions to Ukraine. And certainly in Ukraine, we have a massive injection of credit creation and purchasing power. And they're spending like crazy and they have billions and billions, which, you know, it's not such a huge economy. This is a lot of money. So that money injection may be the main reason why the war is relevant. But if we look at the energy prices, 
One fact is that many people are surprised when you point it out. Now the oil price is lower than before the war started in February. You know, the oil price is already significantly lower. So actually, there was a bit of an increase in, in March, but then it's, it's gone down and it's, it's, it's been below the February, January levels for quite a while. And um, also, if you look into the relationship of oil prices in general and inflation in major economies, we find that, you know, there's episodes where the oil price tripled in one or two years. Um, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, and had no impact on inflation, a tripling of the oil price. Now, we're not even talking now about the tripling. In fact, as I said, it's gone down. So the this seems to me the sort of propaganda story, the smokescreen, to get people's attention away from the real action, which is the central bank's quantitative policies that we should be watching. Thank you, Richard. So, Richard, so suppose next year, 2023, suppose the inflation rate does not return to 2%. So, so what are you going to expect the Federal Reserve will do? For example, cut the interest rates or doing other some kind of specific, specific stuff to, to tighten up? Yes. Well, I've done some empirical work um, on the question of um, what is the relationship between interest rates and economic growth. For example, nominal growth, which includes inflation. And I looked at the major economies um, in the post-war era, the largest, so US, Japan, Germany, and also included the UK. And so this is over half a century. And I looked at different interest rates and nominal GDP growth and just very open-mindedly asking what is the relationship and what we find is that there is a consistent relationship extremely strong but it's not negative it's positive so growth and interest rates are positively correlated and when you then do tests for um, statistical causation such as Granger causality tests or other alternative methods bootstrapping methods to get this kind of statistical causation we find that there's more evidence for causation running from economic growth to interest rates than the other way around. So um, the while the um, English language economics textbook story is lower interest rates lead to higher growth, higher interest rates lead to lower growth, the empirical fact that anyone can check is higher growth leads to higher rates, Lower growth leads to lower rates. And that's true for both market rates, say bond markets, and central bank rates. They follow growth. So as a result, since credit creation was slowed in 21, growth is likely to come down in the US and the UK. Therefore, interest rates are likely to come down again. And that includes central bank interest rates. They're likely to come down fairly, well, sort of soonish. I mean, maybe a few more months. And then they'll, they're likely to come down as economies slow down in the US and the UK, also Eurozone. And after that, well, as I mentioned, we have to see because it looks like then there will be a pickup again. Oh, Richard, I know, Richard. So what you mean is in our traditional textbook, we take interest rates as given and, and thought interest rate where leads to economic growth. And the new empirical finding is, uh, interest rate is the outcome. Is the economic growth that drives the interest rates? Is what you you mean? Precisely. Thank you very much. You put it very well. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, okay, Richard, I I noticed that uh, you has written a very famous book called the Princess of the Yen, and and it's a best seller book in Japan. And I also remember that uh, about uh, three years ago when you were visiting Fudan, you. You, you, it's very nice of you. You gave one copy to me as a, as a gift. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I, I really enjoyed that book. I know it's not about the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve, but it's about the uh, Japanese Central Bank. So, so I want to take this opportunity to, to expand our discussion from U.S. to, to, to Japan a little bit. We, we, we know that you work in Japan for many years. So you understand Japan's financial, uh, 
uh, financial systems well. So how do you compare uh, Japan's central bank versus the U.S. central bank versus the U U.K.'s or, or European central bank? Was was there a key difference and 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 a, and a similarity? Thank you very much. That's a very good question. Uh, perhaps just for the for the audience, uh, the Princes of the Yen book is uh, not yet available in Chinese, but in English at the website quantumpublishers.com. Uh, they'll be happy to send it to China. Um, I hope it will be published in Chinese soon. The uh, the book that is now available in, in Chinese is in the English language is entitled Where Does Money Come From? And that is is more fundamental in a way um, about this question, where does actually our money supply come from? Where does money come from? And of course, the key uh, role is being played by, by banks. And the banks, of course, are being influenced by the central bank. And hence, your question is very, very relevant. Um, how do we compare these different central banks? And of course, um, Princes of the Yen has a lot on the Japanese central bank. But there is a one chapter about the Asian, other Asian central banks. There is one chapter about um, the ECB. And there is a chapter on the Fed in there as well. So one gets a bit of a comparison as well. And so to answer your question, um, the Japanese central bank um, has been um, in many ways um, a sort of experimental ground for... Western central banking, it seems to me, because a lot of things that happened in Japan then later were adopted by the ECB and even by the Federal Reserve. And I don't mean just QE, because before QE, we also had um, other policies that later were copied by, for example, the ECB, just to give you an example. So, but, but the, so the fundamental relationship seems to be that the Bank of Japan has been, um, used by other central banks in the central banking fraternity. You know, they always meet in Basel in Switzerland and they discuss things. And it seems that the Bank of Japan was trying new stuff and then others said, okay, we'll do that. Now, some of that stuff is not good stuff and they still copied it, which again comes back to the earlier question. And why are they doing things that are not wise? Maybe their policy objectives are different. So a key example is the policy of the 1980s that the Bank of Japan adopted. The Bank of Japan had um, put in place since 1942 policy called window guidance. Uh, this is uh, guidance of bank credit. And it's a very powerful tool, which was originally developed by the German Central Bank. And later, you know, Japan uh, copied that like many things from Germany. And... Um, the tool was used for the high growth economic system. And it's a successful tool. And we've seen this also in China. It's a good tool. And the central banks um, have usually used it wisely, uh, certainly in China. Um, but the Bank of Japan then deviated from the 80s. And in my view, this is under US pressure. Because Japan, to put it very simply, was getting too successful for the liking of the Americans. Um, one US industry after another suffered from Japanese competition, whether it was first um, shipbuilding, then steel, then automobiles, then electronics. And so there was a lot of trade friction. America was putting pressure on Japan. You must change your system. You're too close. They couldn't say publicly, you're too successful. So they said, oh, you're inefficient and we'll give you advice on how to be more efficient, which was somewhat... Un, you know, not credible. Are you saying Japan should be even more efficient and even more successful? Well, actually, they were saying, really, um, we want Japan to be less successful. So you please change your policies. And uh, that's a very difficult task for Japan to do. Essentially, the politicians didn't do it. But the Bank of Japan, which is very much under influence of the Federal Reserve um, since 1945, they did it. And you can see it in their plans. They published the Maikawa report um, in the 1980s, which said that there's a 10-year plan to change the economic structure fundamentally, shift away from exports to domestic demand expansion, deregulate, liberalize, privatize, the sort of policies the IMF and the World Bank recommend developing countries to do, which is a good way of reducing 
growth and preventing economic development. So this is a way to weaken the Japanese economy. But how is the Bank of Japan going to implement these policies? And that's where it gets slightly mysterious. They also were not saying it directly. The Maikawa report only says the central bank should use its monetary policy flexibly in order to implement a structural transformation of the economy, including political changes, deregulation, liberalization, privatization. Now, there's only one way you can use monetary policy to do this, and that is by using window guidance to expand bank credit for asset purchases, creating a huge asset bubble, which happened from 86 to 89. It was done under um, Mr. Fukui as head of the um, banking department at the Bank of Japan, who told them you must increase lending for these asset purchases, for property, real estate, speculation. And then they tightened it. They told the banks, no, you must tighten. And then you bust the bubble. The bubble bursts. The banking system goes bust. You get a big recession, a long recession that you can extend if you want to. And they extended it for over 20 years. And during that time, they said things like, oh, see, we're in the recession. The system is not working. We have to implement structural reform and deregulate, liberalize, and privatize. So that's what the Bank of Japan did. Now, it's pretty dramatic stuff, and that's described in, in my book, Princes of the Yen. But I also warn in that book on my chapter on the ECB, which was fairly new. It's one of the younger central banks. And I warned that there were signs the ECB was going to do the same thing. And it did. From 2004 to 2009, the ECB expanded bank credit in Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and Greece, dramatically, 20%, 30%, 40% credit growth for property speculation, just like the Bank of Japan. And then they tightened, they crashed it, and then they said, like the Bank of Japan, oh, we need structural reform, we need deregulation, liberalization, privatization, free market um, economics, just like in Japan, but at a huge cost, 50% youth unemployment in Spain and Greece. These economies still have not recovered. So we see that the Bank of Japan was the pioneer where they tried these horrendous policies. The ECB then adopted them. I even warn in my, in the last chapter in Princes of the Yen, I warn that the Federal Reserve is likely to adopt also similar policies and create a global financial crisis. This was published, you know, years before 2008. Uh, after I met, it, I, I met um, Alan Greenspan personally, and the hints he dropped convinced me that that's what they're, they're doing. He was aware of my work, um, and he, he knew I was watching credit creation, but maybe he wasn't intending to give me hints, but these hints convinced me, and uh, that's exactly what happened. So we see that Japan has been used as, a, as an experimental ground um, for these policies which are being played out in other countries. So that's where, you know, this is where the, the difference is. Oh, I, I see. Uh, thank you, Richard. Richard, we know it's now at the end of 2020 and uh, the new year 2023 is coming. So looking forward, uh, will there be any economic recession next year, please, in your, in your opinion? I think there will be something of a recession. Uh, certainly in real terms, perhaps not entirely in nominal terms because of the, well, inflation getting weaker, but still being there. And so it, nominal GDP will be still stronger, but largely due to the uh, inflation, even though weakening. Um, but it will be felt that there is a slowdown. I think that may already have begun in the UK, um, some signs in the US, in the housing market. Um, and the reason is very simply that credit um, creation, bank credit for the real economy had been slowed after an incredible expansion in 2020. It's quite normal. And if you look at, at um, other incidences, then afterwards, the following year, um, there's a tightening and that means the economy will slow. So I think, yes, it's likely to happen. Okay, then, if that's recession, then, in your opinion, to, to what extent the, the recession will be? Is a relatively minor one? Is a financial crisis? Or, or what extent? 
I think at the moment um, it's going to be a minor recession. Well, although, of course, it's in the eyes of the beholder. If you're in the wrong industries, it can be major to you. Um, but it, it will be a recession, but not of the type, as you, as you were saying, not of the type that it's going to be another huge crisis, at least at the moment. Of course, it could then coincide with other factors, other shocks or policy changes, uh, which could exacerbate it. But at the moment, it looks like only, um, you know, a limited recession. Okay. So then the, even the situation, so, so we are in, in, I'm in China, many of the audience are in China, then as the emerging markets, how should the emerging market make a response to the environment in the, in the next year? Yes. Well, thank you. Um, for emerging markets, um, there's, there's always, and this is true, not just now, but always the issue of having a, a strong, resilient economy that can withstand shocks. Because as an emerging economy, um, and, and, and like any uh, smaller open economy, um, you know, you're subject to international shocks and you have to prepare for that to prevent this from affecting your economy. Now, one important policy is to make sure you don't borrow too much money from abroad and you don't become dependent on foreign money. Now, China has always been very wise on this. Um, the same also historically Japan, they, they never used foreign money um, at all. In fact, in Japan, um, in China, there has been some foreign money, but very limited in absolute, uh, you know, relative amounts. But there's many developing markets and emerging markets that have been using foreign money a lot. And that is quite risky, particularly when there are shocks, the interest rate rises that are happening because growth has accelerated, the rates follow. Um, in the dollar, when you have dollar denominated debt and then the domestic emerging market currencies tend to weaken in that moment, then your debt has increased in domestic market terms. And then emerging market debt can become a problem. That is unfortunately quite a, quite an issue and is quite likely to happen. Similarly to how it became a problem in Europe after the, the ECB created um, property bubble in Ireland, Portugal, Spain and Greece after that burst. Recession next was a, a debt crisis, sovereign debt crisis surrounding um, particularly periphery countries, but Greece and also Spain and so on. Um, and so that's where I would put a number one emphasis at the moment. Um, the other one is simply an obvious one that, of course, emerging markets also need to ensure their energy security. Um, although even developed markets like in Europe sometimes seem to not care about their energy security. As you know, Europe has, particularly Germany, has voluntarily cut off itself from the main source of energy supplies, which has been Russia, very reliable, very cheap energy supplied for, for many decades, even when there was the Soviet Union. Soviet Union always reliably delivered energy to Germany, to Western Europe. Now they're saying under U.S. pressure, no, we don't need this. This is going to create a, a, a big problem for German industry, which is essentially being Germany's being deindustrialized, which seems to be a U.S. policy. Um, I think Kissinger once said that um, it's not good to be America's enemy, but it's much worse to be America's ally. <laughs> Certainly Germany seems to be experiencing that at the moment. Oh, Richard, I remember that uh, starting from 2018, every year you visit uh, China with the Fudan. And then uh, the, the COVID breaks and uh, it's very difficult for, for people to travel to China and uh, also difficult for money to travel to China. And uh, in the, uh, right now, China gradually uh, returned to, to normal. And then suppose in 2023, then then when the, all the foreign people for the foreign money I can come and come to China as, <clears throat> as before, then in this case, the, the monetary policy seems to should be more complicated than the current situation. <laughs> so, so as a, as a friend, so what were, what, the, what kind of advice will you give to, to Chinese central banks in terms of the more complicated, uh, monetary policy in the coming year? Yes. Well, 
I think the most difficult phase was during the period of restrictions. And as normalization increases, I think in some ways it will be easier for both the banks and also the bank regulators and the monetary policy authorities because it, we will get back to normal. And um, I think it's it, it's a good thing um, and it's, it's going to be good for the banking system. The, the main risk I mentioned before for emerging markets in terms of capital flows, that's not such a big problem for China because China has always maintained very wisely sufficient control over its, uh, you know, um, current account and, and particularly the capital flows. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so a capital account, um, policy has been quite wise. So I'm not really concerned there. In fact, my main worry has been watching China. Um, well, if China is weak as an economy because of restrictions, is that really good for the world? It's actually a problem. And I think it's good news that China is returning to normal. It's good for the world economy. Uh, so, Richard, I think my last question is, uh, suppose our audience want to know more about uh, the terminology, the theory about the quantitative easing. So, do you have, can you suggest any uh, books or articles so that, uh, so that they can, they can learn by themselves? Yes, indeed. Well, I would recommend any of my writings, uh, of course. That includes, of course, the book, which is now coming out in the Chinese language is a translation um, with the English language title being Where Does Money Come From? That is a very solid uh, book that gives a lot of details on the monetary system. Um, of course, the, the institutional details are of European nature, particularly the UK system. But the UK is the country where modern banking developed 200 and almost 300 years ago. And so it is quite representative and it's quite similar in other countries. Also, my book, Princes of the Yen at quantumpublishers.com. And also, I think going just online, I have a website called professorwerner.org, organization, you know, .org, uh, professorwerner.org. I've got publications on there. Many are open access, so it's quite easy to just click and get the whole article a lot of articles in, in, in referee to peer reviewed journals that give you the details of how things work. And there's a lot of empirical work because it turns out that economists have often worked very much based on theories, theories that worked in Britain in the 19th century. But I think we have to go beyond that. And so I've been working very empirically concerning how the banking system functions. There is a paper called can banks individually create money out of nothing? Um, which is already the most downloaded article of all Elsevier scientific publications across all disciplines. But I think that that one is also a good one to look up for, uh, for the audience on how banking works. And from that and from my papers, you get a good idea of why I talked about quantitative easing as a policy recommendation. Okay, so uh, Richard, I think I, my, my really last question is inspired by, by you. That is, uh, you mentioned so many different central banks across the world. So, in your opinion, which which conference central bank using quantitative easing relatively wisely? Well, if you had asked me um, um, three years ago, I could have probably even, even included the Federal Reserve, certainly the 2008 episode. It was quite wise then, but sadly 2020 um, was not, not a good way of using QE, so I have to drop the Fed. Um, if we use a general definition of QE, namely to include quantitative credit policies in general, which is really what it is. I mean, it's a specialized type for emergency situation, but more generally, really my policy recommendation always is to look at the quantity of bank credit and also its disaggregation. Because if credit is used, bank credit is mainly used for consumption, you get inflation. If it's used for asset purchases, you get asset inflation and banking crises. But if bank credit is used for productive business investment, 
in you know new technologies, increasing uh, productivity, you will get high growth without inflation. And so all the central banks that have watched this have done really well. And that is, of course, the secret also of the East Asian economic miracle, um, in which, of course, I think we have to include China, because, as I mentioned, the four decades of double-digit economic growth has been an, a historic, I mean, marvel. And, you know, we shouldn't call it miracle in the sense that it's impossible. It did happen. <laughs> and we should be really happy about that. And at the core of that is a quantity of credit policy. So clearly the Chinese central bank is an example of those central banks that have used credit policies wisely. Okay, thank you, Richard. It was always a very, my great pleasure to talk to you and learn from you.